Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Keeping the World Company. Possibly we should name it Keeping the World Safe. And the question is uh, to respond or not to respond to Iran's attack. That is the question for Israel, Netanyahu, and in large part, the United States. So today for this discussion, we have co-host Tim Apicella, Jean Rosenfeld, uh, Manfred Henningsen for an important discussion. Let me start with you, Tim. Um, you know, what, what are Iran's capabilities now? Uh, we saw what it did with the hundreds of uh, rockets, missiles, and drones. Um, has it depleted its capability, or can it do it again? Um, what are what are its um, prospects of doing it again? Um, well, since Iran is supplying Russia with its drone technology and their drones, uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to guess that they have quite a bit in supply. Uh, in their inventory of drones. And so to answer your question, will, are they capable of doing it again? Uh, certainly they are. Um, they're manufacturing drones. And so as long as they're getting supplies from other countries, uh, the components, um, they'll continue to manufacture drones. Um, maybe the CIA knows best on what other capabilities they have as far as their nuclear development program. Um, I don't know if that's been in the news a whole lot lately, but I would think that they're quietly working and making progress towards their capability of nuclear weapons. And um, they, are, they are a threat to the Middle East and they're a threat to the world. Mm. So Gene, what do we hear in the rhetoric? Um, there is rhetoric, there has to be rhetoric. Without you know, rhetoric, there would be a vacuum and so, um, both Israel and Iran have to fill that vacuum with rhetoric. What is the rhetoric? Well, Iran is um, quite public and global about its um, sense that Israel has overstepped in assassinating the leaders um, in Lebanon aligned with Iran. And Iran wanted um, to send a huge message to Israel. <clears throat> But behind that, there is some question that it's a bit of a paper tiger because, quite frankly, Iran does not want a wider war either right now. So Why not? We have, because they have some internal problems. And by the way, they just had horrible floods in the south part of the country. Yes. Um, but they have internal stability problems. The... Um, Military is being outsourced to these proxies who are closer to Israel, the uh, asymmetrical groups, the four asymmetrical groups that term themselves the axis of resistance, which, of course, is headed by Hamas, uh, working with the Iranian military. But the mullahs themselves um, are in a more weakened position vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian military from some of the things that I've read. And it's the Iranian military that is more aggressive. However, they know what the stakes are in a very volatile situation, just as the United States does. So Iran and the United States may find separately <laughs> a way to quell this. It is Israel that's uh, being a bit more vocal about how bold it is going to be in retaliation. Uh, the rhetoric in Israel is, again, um, we need to show Iran strength because this was an unprecedented attack uh, direct from Iran, not through a, po a proxy, which is very unusual. And they sent 300 missiles and drones over uh, Israel, which, of course, Israel counteracted with the United States quite well. Nonetheless, I think what Iran wanted to do was uh, make a big... Um, show for its domestic audience more than anything else, and for those that are uh, subscribing to the Palestinian Hamas narrative of the war, uh, rather than, uh, it's sort of a rattle the rockets, rather than actually do damage and invite a huge reprisal. But given Israel and this government's history of boldness and um, disproportionate response, if I may say that, um, we're sort of waiting for the Israeli coalition government with Gantz in it 
to come to some agreement on how it's going to respond. It says it is going to respond. However, it strikes me that Passover is coming, which is the largest holiday in, in Israel. And they, I don't think, I think they want to wait until Passover is over with because they don't want to re invite reprisals on Passover, which groups have a tendency to do in picking their, their calendrical dates on when they will retaliate. Yeah, sure. Think of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. It was on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the, the Jewish calendar. But let me add a couple of points, and then we'll go to Manfred. Um, number one is the populations, as I mentioned before the show, Israel has a population of uh, something around 9 million, um, and um, Iran has a population of 88 million. So you can see there, it's a much bigger country, not only in land size, it's huge in land size, but also in population. It's a, a serious country. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, I think there's been some confusion about exactly what Israel did so as to invite this uh, reprisal. Israel did not bomb uh, uh, an embassy. Um, it bombed a building next to a consulate. Okay? And the reason, and it was not unintentional, the reason it bombed that building was what that was where the military officers were. Um, and it, it wanted to uh, destroy the military officers, um, and it wanted to, I suppose, assassinate uh, the military leadership in, in that office. But uh, there's been a certain amount of news and misunderstanding, I think, about billing, uh, rather, uh, bombing a, uh, uh, an embassy. Um, it, it was not even a consulate. It was the building next door, and it was intentional. <clears throat> the other thing I, I, wanted, I wanted to go to Manfred about this. Uh, Manfred, you know, what about Israel doing nothing? Um, Passover or no Passover? What about just doing nothing? How will that play? I think uh, in that regard, you could say Israel is in a very strong position, and it would be smart uh, for to not do anything. You know, to uh, let to not uh, respond in the way uh, that would provoke, you know, more than a regional war, but uh, a larger uh, confrontation. But I do not think uh, Israel will wait because uh, Netanyahu, you know, is a pretty arrogant politician. The way he treated the British and the German foreign minister over the weekend uh, is an indication of that, that he doesn't listen to any advice. Um, do you, do you think it's that, just him, Manfred? Huh? Because, you know, we, we, we are given to understand that Manfred sits at the head of the table, but the table is a big table. It's his war cabinet, and there's some strong personalities. Is it just his decision alone? No, I mean, look, that war cabinet uh, includes uh, genocidal figures, people, you know, who have nothing against the wiping out, you know, mm -hmm. the Palestinians in, in, in Israel, you know, repeating some of the... the measures that they're taking in 1948, you know. Um, and uh, for that reason, I think Netanyahu is under pressure from within his cabinet. But uh, Israel in itself is uh, divided over this issue. And I think uh, the sooner Netanyahu leaves office, the better, you know, for, for Israel. Well, do you think it would be a good idea uh, for him to lead, leave office right now? I mean, we're talking about a show of strength. And I think Israel has learned since 1948, if not before, um, that if you do nothing, uh, if you show weakness, you invite more attack. Yes, but in this case, you know, he, he may provoke uh, responses by <clears throat> countries that are supporting Israel. Uh, have been supporting Israel for quite some time, uh, the United States especially, uh, but uh, Germany as well. I mean, it's the second largest uh, supporter of Israel. And to treat them as if, uh, you know, they have nothing to say, I find, 
unbelievable. I mean, the arrogance of Netanyahu is, is absolutely stunning. Uh, okay, so I want to go to Tim on that. Tim, uh, um, you know, uh, Netanyahu and a lot of people in Israel have said, look, we don't, we don't really, we can't really count on external help. Um, it comes, it goes, uh, there are political considerations and so forth uh, in every country uh, where they may or may not help us at a given moment. Um, and we will do this alone. I think that's Netanyahu's view of it and a lot of people in Israel. Um, does that work now? Is that, is that a, true, uh, a true consideration? Or must they consider the views of other countries, including the U.S., to make this decision? Well, the go to loan approach is typical of, of Netanyahu's um, kind of philosophy. Um, but at the same time, if he's relying upon military and financial aid from the United States, um, <clears throat> that's only going to be so effective for so long. I, I think, you know, just looking at it from afar, that Netanyahu is kind of in a position where he has taken a lot of heat internally about his response in the Gaza area. Um, you're looking at 33, 34,000 deaths of civilians. Uh, he's, he's, he is being heavily criticized for that. Uh, although he's going under the, you know, th that it is a war and Hamas is the target of that war, but he's still under a lot of criticism. So I think we have a situation here with Iran that, and we had this in the United States more than once, is the tail that wags the dog. Let's create something out of something that was pretty minor, uh, as far as uh, deaths and casualties in Israel from the attack of the drones and the missiles from Iran. And let's turn this into something that I can get, divert attention away from my criticism and, um, you know, go to a new page, if you will. And that new page may be its response to Iran. Um, President uh, Biden said, hey, you got a victory here, take it, which is to say, Iran threw everything it had at you, or at least uh, threw a lot at what they had at Israel, and it, nothing happened. So take the victory and, um, you know, log that in to your, your victory book. I'm going to yeah. add that if, if just one of those big missiles had hit in central Israel, over Tel Aviv, for example, it would have been enormously destructive. Different uh, so story. This was, this was, well, yeah. Different story. Agreed. Different story, but all I'm saying is, um, you know, this was not, this was not a faint, modest, mild-mannered attack. Uh, this was the real McCoy. And uh, if, if it happens again and the Iron Dome isn't able to stop it, um, there will be much greater, there could be much greater destruction. You, let, you let me go to Gene. Gene, I, I want to put you at the table. I want to put you in the war cabinet. Um, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you don't, you don't uh, get uh, too, too warlike in this matter. Um, but here we are. You're in the, the, the war room uh, with uh, Netanyahu and uh, these guys. Uh, Manfred feels there's a lot of uh, very warlike guys at that table. Um, how, what kind of considerations would you raise at that table uh, to guide the group, the decision, the consensus, or, uh, you know, the, the, the buck stops, I suppose, with Netanyahu? What considerations would you raise in making this decision? Find a sweet spot. Uh, find a sweet spot between overreaction and no reaction. I don't think there can be no reaction because it is, uh, Iran did conduct an unprecedented attack directly on Israel, even though it may not have wanted to damage Israel to the point where Israel would respond in kind. Some kind of significant attack on Iran's facilities that would not necessarily kill civilians or trigger uh, an enormous response, although I don't know what enormous response Iran could make. Uh, they are a bit of a uh, in a bind themselves. Can they really do damage to Israel? We don't know. Nevertheless, what happens with regimes is they follow their same patterns. And the pattern of Netanyahu, he is, in essence, a strong man, even though he's been elected. He is in a very powerful position in Israel. The Israelis are very demoralized. 
they are split down the middle and they they are in a state of apathy as my recent studies have demonstrated a majority of people will either fall into line or become apathetic even when they disagree with policies at the top at the authoritative level so it's in netanyahu's court he's not going to listen to find the sweet spot although i think he's getting a lot of pressure from germany the united states france inside uh his cabinet from gantz and his uh cohort to do that um i'm not a military person so i don't know what that would consist of but clearly it has to have the perception of a response directly on Iran, not its proxies. At the same time, it also has to be a bit of a paper tiger, such as Iran's attack on Israel. It's a battle of prestige and perception. But the, in, but the pattern of Netanyahu, number one, as a strong man, is to show a robust response to a kinetic situation. And because that always solidifies support at home or demoralizes those who would intervene. And secondly, um, uh, Netanyahu is a personality uh, who, in essence, uh, is, is not going to listen to anybody. He has very little empathy. He is not looking beyond his borders. He, to some extent, is in his own echo chamber. Oh, that's very interesting. I was going to raise that with Manfred. Um, you know, Man Manfred, uh, this is different. This is not having Hamas, or, you know, in, inside uh, the, the, the borders of Israel and Gaza. Uh, it, it's not like um, the Houthis or Hezbollah. It's not like uh, Islamic Jihad, which is all right there, right there. This is a thousand miles away. Uh, this is a new kind of war. This is a war where you throw missiles and rockets and drones thousands of miles, and some of them take eight or nine hours to get there. Uh, and this is and this is a coming out, isn't it? It's a coming out by Iran. This is, you know, it's Iran's out of the closet. No more deniability. Uh, no more, you know, hiding behind proxies. This is the real deal. And I suggest to you, I like your opinion on this, I suggest to you that this has changed the calculus. It has changed the arrangement. And that is why uh, some of these countries in, in Europe, that namely uh, Germany and France, have sided with Israel because they realize this is a real war among big countries, David and Goliath, as a matter of fact, in a funny way, um, and that it's different than just terror, remote terror proxies. What are your thoughts about the new dimension? Well, I'm not so sure that's the new dimension. I think Israel is in a very strong position at this point, and I agree with Tim, you know, it would be uh, advantageous for it in terms of real power and in terms of imagery to not respond the way, you know, everybody thinks uh, Israel will respond, to sit still. Uh, because everybody has seen that uh, Israel is in a strong position and it can do whatever, you know, is needed in order to defend itself. So for that reason, I think it would be smart to not respond um, and, uh, you know, let... Uh, How about the, the downside of that, Manfred? I mean, we know uh, that... Terror organizations, including terror states, uh, are attracted like uh, like sugar um, to non-action. They're attracted to weakness, and and this will invite non-action. Israel responded and got uh, you know support from even uh, Jordan, and uh, so for that reason, I think it is in a very strong position and. Uh, Netanyahu, you know, telling uh, the British prime foreign minister and the German foreign minister over the weekend, we will not listen to anyone. We will make our own decisions based on our uh, our own reasoning. I think it's stupid. Uh, it is simply arrogance. But and Jim, I, what do you what do you think? I mean, well, uh, this, we have seen the United States give advice to Israel over the past well since October seventh. 
We have seen uh, advice, um, and, and more than advice, we have seen demands made by various countries on how Israel should conduct itself militarily and strategically. Um, is Netanyahu justified in saying we'll go it alone? Well, um, is he justified? If, if, if push comes to shove, sure, why not? I mean, they have a sovereign right to defend themselves. Uh, but I want to get back to, you know, no response versus the sweet spot versus a full response. And I think, you know, there's something in between a kinetic response, a kinetic warfare military response to a non-kinetic response. Um, hey, Israel has some great computer scientists. There is something called cyber warfare, a non-kinetic response, yet very effective and sends a message. Uh, but no lives are lost. Um, that's certainly an option that Israel has at its disposal uh, with or without the help of the United States and its technology on cyber warfare. Um, you know, there's other, we could talk about sanctions, but you know, uh, those are pretty, I mean, there's already a ton of uh, sanctions against Iran, both from the United States and the EU countries, and um, doesn't seem to stop Iran from manufacturing drones. They get the, the parts, the technology. Um, it doesn't seem to stop them. So sanctions, I think, is kind of worn thin. But uh, certainly there is a sweet spot, and I agree with Gene on that point. Uh, some response is required, but an over-response is going to be detrimental to, um, to Israel and the, and the whole Middle East. Yeah, Gene, what about a change up here? You know, uh, maybe Israel should be really creative, really clever, and change up the situation. I mean, throwing rockets and drones and missiles uh, back in Iran sounds almost boring at this point. Um, what should the level of military response be, if at all? And non-military response and, uh, you, know, com you know, internet response, if you will, or targeted assassinations, which, you know, could be effective, or um, the destruction of infrastructure, like, like uh, there's been some discussion about um, destroying the factory where the Shahid missiles are made. Um, all kinds of possibilities here. Um, what do you think about a change-up? Well, we have to sort of back up for a minute and look at the alliances and the whole region as well, because we're talking about trying to avoid a regional war while mounting a response which has a show of strength without much damage. That's that's the dilemma, really. And uh, what we have to look at is Saudi Arabia and the uh, UAE and Bahrain and Qatar, um, because there is a process in place to make peace with Israel. We have to remember that Iran is an enemy of Saudi Arabia. They are Shia. Saudi Arabia is Sunni. Iran has sponsored terrorist attacks on Saudi Arabian airfields through its box, um, um, uh, oil fields through its proxies. So I don't think Saudi Arabia would be unhappy if there was a balanced response from Israel, say they uh, kinetically attacked some kind of drone manufacturing facility uh, that would send a message, not do much damage, but at least be visible to the Israeli public. Um, because first of all, Israel is the smallest strong state in the Middle East. It's surrounded by a sea of potential enemies. And it has always defended itself by projecting an image of military strength. Uh, how they convert that to peace and stability, I have no idea. But um, I think in this case, some kind of kinetic response that has a perception of strength, that doesn't do damage and invite a greater response that will be taken by Iran as a tip for tat. And okay, let's now sit back and relax a little bit and let our proxies do the job. Um, that's what I think they're aiming for. Yeah. So, Manfred, you've made it clear that you feel that no action is the best action by Israel at this point. I, I got that. Um, but I want to ask you about, and that, at least in your view, is the best result, the best case for Israel and for the Middle East. Um, what about the worst result? What happens if Israel does a disproportionate or 
arguably disproportionate uh, counterattack on Iran. What happens to Israel, to Iran, to the Middle East, and to Europe? Look, I think it would be politically very stupid uh, to launch a major attack on Iran. And there is a reason that we have not talked about, uh, and that is uh, the, the impact of the destruction of Gaza by uh, the IDF. Thomas Friedman has written some extraordinary articles about uh, the impact of what it had on the Palestinians. They begin to question the rationality of their leadership uh, because they are confronted now with the destruction of their life worlds from the north to the south, uh, returning, some of them returning. Uh, so what you have here is the self-destruction of Hamas in Palestine. If, the, if Israel moves now on uh, Iran, I think the whole situation will uh, revert again. And uh, for that reason, I think there are two reasons to not militarily act any in any way to the uh, attacks on the, the drone attacks by by Iran. Number one, it, it includes. I mean, it creates danger for the emerging coalitions in the Middle East, and I think it. it, it re, revitalizes the bad image, the image loss of Israel through its behavior in Gaza. I mean, that image loss is absolutely stunning uh, around the world. And I do not think that uh, Israel has to contribute, has to continue losing uh, its image in, in the world, not only in the U.S., but in Europe and all over. Okay, okay. Uh, Tim, you know, the, arguably you can say that this, uh, you know, that the, um, um, this has revealed um, the true uh, nature of Iran. It has, you know, sort of taken the gloves off as far as Iran's concerned. And, and what I think is interesting is um, the same time that Iran made its uh, attack on Israel, um, we had attacks on Israel going from uh, Hezbollah to uh, Hamas and in the West Bank and so forth, uh, and for that matter, in uh, uh, in the Houthis. So it was coordinated. Now, that was the other part of the, the gloves off revelation um, that this this attack with the missiles and the drones and you know all that uh, from Iran was coordinated with attacks from all of the proxies at the same time on the same day. And let me add too that since. Um, you know, the attack from Iran, those attacks by the proxies have continued. This is not a lull uh, for them. Uh, they're still getting, you know, support, maybe instructions from Iran, and they're still attacking Israel, even while we sit and wait um, on the war cabinet to make a decision. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it's hard to actually see this as, as the end. It may be a lull as far as the you know the sort of the national involvement, the visible involvement of Iran, but it hasn't really changed Iran's puppet mastery. Um, so your thought about whether this signals um, a relaxation or the possibility of a relaxation of of the proxies? Oh, I don't think it's a relaxation at all. Um, I think that'll be steady. I, I think. Again, I think Iran risks its major income stream. If 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 people really say the heck the heck with it, let's really start doing some uh, deep sanctions on the uh, Iran's ability to export oil. Uh, I know Biden doesn't want that because uh, that means higher prices at the gas pump in our communities, and that certainly is not a vote for vote Joe Biden at the uh, November election time time frame. Uh, but that would be Iran's worst fear is that EU and the United States and other countries would be in a coalition to really clamp down on the export of oil. And so um, I don't personally, I don't think that Iran's going to move aggressively against Israel any more than it has already. Um, 
I think they got their 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 shot in uh, for net, you know the, for their their pride and the safe face. I think they did what they they needed to do as far as the, from their perspective, and um, I don't think they're going to be in an aggressive mode it, further here unless again it's a tit for tat response. Mm, it's so complex. But, Gene, I ask you a question of complexity, really very complex. <clears throat> now, with Biden, he's got the problem of the Muslim community in the United States. He's got the problem of the woke community in the United States and across the campuses and so forth, which hasn't gone away. It's not like this changed their view of things. Uh, uh, maybe you think it has changed their view of things. But my question to you is, what does Joe Biden do now? How much pressure does he impose on uh, Netanyahu in Israel? Does he back off? What does he say to the public? Uh, we're in a different leg of the journey, aren't we? And what does Joe Biden do to maintain his, his campaign? Well, the campaign issues are separate from the real politic that is going on by the administration. The administration is clearly taken the stance that they do not want Israel to retaliate. Every time the United States takes a positive position on something, it puts its reputation out there and its ability to um, influence and persuade its own allies. Israel is a major ally of the United States. And um, we have um, a direct interest in keeping that war from expanding. And Biden has shown on many fronts that he is not for getting the United States more embroiled in wars, but wanting to hold the line or uh, retract our involvement in wars. Without making the United States look weak or ineffectual, I think the major thing is for him to get reelected uh, so that he can continue the policies he wants to build back the United States domestically to a position of strength and also in terms of the world's perception. But you can't make the complexity of this war go away. It's part of the larger hybrid war that Russia is waging upon the West with its proxies, uh, which are a little bit bigger than Iran's proxies and include Iran. So. Uh, first, Biden has to get elected. He has to find a sweet spot in his own followers between those that are pro-Palestinian and those that are pro-Israeli, which is very, very hard to do in a kinetic, polarized situation. Um, I think he's going to stick with no response. And then if Israel does mount a um, balanced or minimal response, um, I think they will somehow find a way to rationalize that, to say, well, you know, national sovereignty is at play here, and uh, Israel is being surrounded, and so forth, and so on, as on a many-front war, and, and they'll walk it back. But if Israel were to do something, <laughs> what Banford calls stupid, then um, the Biden administration would be in a tough place, because Everybody knows that Trump is acting like president already, inviting world leaders to his southern White House and uh, at Mar-a-Lago, and um, that Trump would be even, uh, he would be in Netanyahu's camp, basically. Okay, it's time for us to do uh, summaries. Uh, let, me, let me go to Manfred first. And Manfred, let me suggest that what you could cover here is um, the problem of the forever war. It's been called the forever war because it has no sign, really, of letting up um, and with substantial likelihood that it will continue to, uh, uh, you know, get worse. Um, and, um, um, you know, you know, the theory of the theory of war is that people make war until they get tired of making war and then they make peace and then they get tired of peace and then they make war again. It's a sort of never ending cycle in humanity and human history, I think. So the question is, uh, when is this going to come to an end? Uh, and how much worse will it get, as you see it, before it does come to an end? 
Well, I don't know whether it will come to an end soon or whether it will come to an end at all. I mean, you are confronted here with, when you're looking at the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians and the historically the Arab world as a whole, after all, you have to remember from 1948 on, uh, the Arab states made constantly war on Israel. But we are at this moment in a situation where maybe there would be the possibility of a break. Uh, and it would uh, also be the possibility of new alliances uh, emerging. Uh, but uh, I think that's a very tiny uh, chance that this will really happen. I mean, when you are looking at, uh, when you're looking at Netanyahu's cabinet, you have their members that really don't give a damn uh, about uh, what is happening to Palestinians. They actually want to have ethnic cleansing. They want to get rid of all of the Palestinians out of Israel from the Jordan River to the I, sea. I will take issue with that. I won't argue with you. I well, just want you to know I have, take issue with that. You have, uh, I mean, you have the same uh, situation with Hamas. They want to get rid of all Israelis from the Jordan River to the sea. So you have here, you know, potentially two uh, totalitarian confrontations uh, in the making that could be avoided at this point. But it depends on how I think re, uh, Israel, led by Netanyahu, uh, can uh, restrain his... Uh, okay, cabinet. got it. Tim, let me ask you to make your final statement here. Um, and let me uh, suggest to you that one big question is, uh, this is kind of a Ronald Reagan question, um, is Israel safer now? or less safe um, for the average citizen, for the people who live uh, in, at the periphery, and for the state of Israel in general? Well, as long as Netanyahu is the, the leader of Israel, um, they're going to be less safe. I'm sorry, but um, he's not the right person for the job. And I've felt that for many years. Um, I think he wants Donald Trump to become president again. I think they have uh, very similar personalities in many ways. Um, but being that aside, I, I think that Israel's response towards uh, either Iran or how they continue and proceed in the, the Gaza region is, is going to be up to Netanyahu and his cabinet. And I think they will go it alone if they, if they have to. And that even may mean a, a cutback in military support from the United States. Um, I think Netanyahu would be happy to risk that. Um, mm -hmm. My last thought is that uh, you cannot subtract out the the United States election, presidential election, from this equation. They're they're linked, and Joe Biden knows that they're linked. And uh, Joe Biden is suffering the same fate, almost as bad as President Johnson did in 1967, 68, and 69. Campuses across the country are not turning out for Joe Biden because of this conflict and the support um, that has been communicated to the world. Uh, U.S. support to Israel. And uh, it's not just Michigan. It's not just the Muslim community in Michigan that's causing this dissension. Uh, it's, again, the campuses around the country. Oh, Gene, let me, let me go to you and, and suggest that in your final comment, you address the question of uh, what happens if life on the campuses gets tougher? Um, what happens if, um, you know, for one reason or another, the president, uh, the campaign, the Congress, they back away from Israel. They they say, look, we don't we don't like uh, Netanyahu's moves, and we're not going to fund it anymore. We're not going to support it. We're going to we're going to have a rift with our oldest ally in the middle, in the modern Middle East, um, and with the only democracy in the model the Middle East. But uh, we we have decided that we're going to back off from Israel. What happens to Israel? What happens to the Middle East? What happens to the liberal world order? Well. Uh couple of things. First of all, the situation in Gaza has gotten to the point where it recalls what was often said about, um, about Rome uh, and their military uh, depredations. 
uh, they make a desolation and call it peace. Um, the perspective coming out of Gaza, particularly today with some videos about children being killed, being very graphic, is they make a desolation and call it peace. Uh, Netanyahu can't engage with that. He doesn't have the capacity to engage with that. The Israeli people can engage with that, but they're apathetic or they're caving. So um, the United States has the main fallout from that. And what they are doing, uh, are they, they are correcting for the initial response of the uh, pro-Hamas narrative uh, organizations um, like Jewish Voice for Peace, um, Voices for Peace, in, um, in condoning, basically, by not um, uh, talking against the, the original pogrom against the Jews that the Gazans, uh, that the uh, Hamas uh, perpetrated on the Jews. They had, and, and, and so what you have now is a crackdown because two major university presidents have lost their posts. And a third, Columbia's president, is currently testifying uh, in Congress. And so what you're getting on the part of administrations is um, to really push back against anti-Semitism and to really crack down on pro-Palestinian demonstrations. But that's not gonna work because <laughs> we found during uh, the anti-Vietnam protest time, as Tim has brought up, that only fuels more protests. And it also uh, delegitimizes the anti-protest and anti-Semitic uh, 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 pushback because uh, we have a First Amendment in this country <laughs> that allows people to protest. So we're in a bad situation. Biden's in a bad situation. Uh, the okay. other thing, but the only thing in, in his favor is that everybody knows who is pro-Palestinian, that if Trump gets in, uh, he'll be even more anti-Palestinian. I don't know if that affects the equation at all. Well, one thing one thing seems clear from this discussion is that the, the Israeli model of tit for tat is no longer appropriate. Uh, and that the Israelis will have to be much more clever and they will have to be much more mm, coordinated, if you will, with the allies with the countries, uh, the liberal countries in Europe and the U.S., um, this is different now. Uh, I don't know if you can say that the Iran attack made it all that much different, but it's different certainly than it was before October 7th. Uh, so it's, it's, it's incumbent on the Israelis, the country, the war cabinet, and Netanyahu himself to be much more clever, much more global, much more responsive to the winds that blow, because they could be the winds of war. Thank you so much, Manfred Hendrickson, Gene Rosenfeld, Tim Abichel. A very important discussion. Aloha. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.